Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone's Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, now accepting residents. They also offer day stay and respite programs. Call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. And I'd also like to acknowledge that the Senior Community Center is on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. We honor them. And it's my pleasure today to introduce to you to the queen of plants, the, the one who is a caretaker of Mother Earth, Anne Lovejoy. Hi, Anne. Hi, Karen. Thank you for such sweet talk. Um, I would like to say, though, that if anyone has questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand or um, speak up because you all know I can talk for a really long time, but I might not hit the thing you're interested in. So I'd love to know what your questions are so I can try to answer them. One thing I will talk a little bit about that I think you've probably all noticed is that this is the coldest April in over 100 years. And so <laughs> I saw tomato starts out in a couple places and it was like, please, people don't do that. Don't try to plant your beans yet. Don't try to plant peppers or eggplants. Or if you're going to, if you have a little greenhouse or even a, a sun porch, you could probably get a good start on them. But don't put them outside yet because they're not ready for what nature is offering us these days. It's cold out there. Um, and the nights are still down in the 30s. And that's one of the big things, like the night temperature has a lot to do with the soil temperature. And so even on the days when it bumps up into the 50s, Sometimes at night it's going down to 37, 38, or even the other day it was 31. Um, so we have to watch those temperatures as well. It's a little different if you're planting in containers because big containers above the ground are gonna warm up faster and, and hold their heat a little bit better than the ground itself. But I'd still say it's not time to put out anything. And this year, Mother's Day super early. It's like May 6th or something. Don't, no, think about uh, the end of May. Not early. For my tomatoes, Anne? No, I wouldn't put them out yet at all. Uh -huh. No way. No, I won't. I won't. It's crazy Actually, cold. And I have kind of a dilemma. I've got a couple of questions for you. I'll wait on the other one. But the tomatoes, our neighbor has a greenhouse and she had a couple of starts that she was selling on the road, which is lovely, right? So I bought these three starts. I've got them inside. I've got them on the only sunny kind of, you know, with area super, you know, so they're, but they're growing and they're in these tiny pots and they're like this long. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I guess what I'll do, I'm not, obviously I'm not putting them out, but I think I need to get them in something because they're just, yeah, how do I manage these little babies? Great question. Um, and Wendy, what you can do is, first of all, you can pinch the top. Oh, and that okay. will push it out and make it have more side shoots. Also, tomatoes are unlike a lot of other plants. If you bury them deeply, yeah, new roots will, you know how hairy those stems are? All yeah. those are incipient roots. And so if you got deep gallons or even a two gallon pot and you planted them up to their necks practically, all that would put, put create roots on the bottom, which would give you a much stronger, sturdier plant. So I would say you could pot them up now in a gallon and then in another few, you know, I wouldn't, if you have a deep tree pot, like those deeper ones, yeah. I'd use that. So you can okay. really, because if they're really tall, you don't want all that tall, weak foliage, no. right? So pinch out the top, make sure there's still four to six inches above the soil, but everything okay. else. And when you do that, you take the leaves off, cut them, trim them off or pinch them off. Okay. Um, you don't want leaves rotting underground, but, um, and usually what I'll do is pinch the leaves and let them sit for a day or two to heal that wound. Okay. It will seal over pretty fast right. and then plant them. God, this is great. How yeah. would I know this stuff without you? Thank you. Make you. a lot of mistakes and kill a lot of plants. That's one way to do it. 
but then I'm going to put them in these big pots and I'll leave them inside, obviously. Yeah. And tell, and then can I take them and put them in? to a bed later or do I yes. really probably need to keep them in the pots? You know, one of the things is we're in one of those swing years. It's the, it's called the ENSA that like um, El Nino, La Nina oscillating something or other. And it, um, what it's like, what it means usually is it's colder than usual and probably a little drier than usual this year though that hasn't proved the case. But, you know, interestingly we've had a fair amount of rain and a lot of gray days, but we, the ground is quite dry. Oh. Right. And oh, even okay. though we're close to normals, it hasn't come in normal ways. And so a lot of those days when it just drizzles a little, it doesn't really do much good. Um, and we haven't had, like the marine layer days are super helpful because those gray mornings lock moisture in, but we've mm -hmm. had a lot of wind and the wind mm -hmm. sucks moisture out. So yes. that's one of the issues with planting early stuff that um, if it dries out as it can really easily, even, even in April, um, it can be a problem. So when you do get around to putting them outside, you want to be sure like you give them a little protection. And one way to do that is like put the cage on right away so that you don't injure the roots when you plant them. Like, yeah. Right? Okay. So many people wait until the plant is big and then you stick it in and then you break off a whole bunch of roots. But if you put the plant in and put the cage in right away, oh. that really helps. Put down some good compost mulch on top of that. You can also start mulching with uh, ground, used coffee grounds, which do a couple things. They deliver a lot of slow nitrogen, but they're also really good at resisting different blights, like early blight and late blight, for instance, which is one of the things that can happen to our tomatoes when they're cold and they're not very happy. And their leaves start turning yellow and they look really funky. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So if you put the cage in place, you can now do a couple things. You can wrap it with bu bubble wrap which is like an insulating layer, put the bubbly bits on the inside and that will capture some air and then cover it at night and then take the cover off or have a loose cover over the top so that it, air exchange still happens because you don't want to set up a situation for mold and mildew, but you do want to preserve a few degrees of warmth in there because then it might be like 45 instead of 38, right? Um, and that will help them be a lot happier. Or you can use, you know, heavy duty plastic, the kind that you would use as a, you know, a painting drop cloth that you would use over and over that heavy mill. I forget what uh -huh. heavy mill it is, but you know what I mean. Um, and even if it has paint on it, it doesn't matter. You can cut a piece of that, wrap it around, and uh, and that will help provide some protection too. Great. On the cage question, you know, every year I plant tomatoes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I keep trying, but I've got blight, obviously, and I don't want I haven't thrown the cages away I reuse them is that an issue because I've read that you're not supposed to use the same cages because of the blight and all of that no. I mean if you rub them down with rubbing alcohol yeah boom okay and the cage Good. is not where it's coming from it's coming from the air and um, you know it's blowing in the wind it's from the soil and so when yes. you put the compost layer down the clean new compost that prevents some of the soil mm -hmm. contamination from crossing over. You want good air circulation though. And so when I'm saying, you know, wrap it, that's like for the cold time. When, as soon as it starts to warm up, then you take it off because, and you don't, and maybe, you know, you slip it on, on a cold night and you don't, you know, if you're home and mm -hmm. you're able to do it, you can really gauge, you know, if it's a really hot day, take it off, right? Because one of the oh. interesting things about tomatoes is like, if it gets over 80 degrees, they start aborting their flowers. We think of them as heat lovers and they are to a point, but they come oh. actually from, you know, they're originating in areas where it doesn't necessarily get 120 degrees or whatever. Right, um, right. And that heat dome last year, tomatoes all over the place just dropped every bloom they had. Boom, right? Mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that, was not, that was not happiness for tomatoes either. So too mm -hmm. cold or too hot, too dry, too wet, too this, too that. You know, what they yeah. like is rich, good garden soil, decent air circulation, protection from cold at night. And they do like to be fed. They're kind of gross feeders. And I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought they didn't like to be fed. Well, they wrong. like to be fed certain things. They don't like high nitrogen. Okay. So one of the things you want, you don't want to go with those Peters 20, 20, 20 kinds of things like you might put in a pot of annuals that you wanted to just petunia out all summer, right? Right, right, right. And so tomato specific, like Dr. Earth has a good line of, of uh, 
granulated organic food that you can scatter over the top and just scratch in lightly. And you can do that every couple of weeks. Because one of the things that happens, especially with plants that are in containers, is as we water, we're leaching out right. all the stuff that we're putting in, right? Mm. And coffee grounds. Yes, mm -hmm. used coffee grounds are fabulous. Um, let them cool off, take the filter. Yeah. <laughs> They're good for a lot of things. Like you can use them on your house plants too. They're, you know, a gentle source of nitrogen and, and a long, slow release. And they are quite effective at, at certain kinds of, um, like fending off some of the blights, which is great, right? Yeah. They also are effective against slugs yeah. and snails, though that's usually not a problem with, um, with tomato plants. The hairiness and the strong scent is, it doesn't attract a lot of pests on the whole. So how often on the coffee grounds? Well, I'd replace them every month. Yeah, okay. All right. Roses and yes. rhododendrons also love coffee. If you guys are coffee drinkers, lots of places will be happy to have your coffee grounds. At the I library, back at, in the day, we used to go to the, all the coffee stalls on the island and collect garbage cans full of coffee grounds and put them in our compost, and they were amazing. Um, great soil. Yeah. There was a... Um, a uh, coffee shop in Paulsbo and they had these huge bags of used coffee grounds that they were giving away for gardening. Yeah. I yeah. thought that's great yeah. to have that just in a basket. Anybody could take them. So yeah, that's cool. Thanks. Sure. In, Linda? Just along that same line, and this is a gross question perhaps, but I use kitty litter that is pine pellets. And so what is dumped is simply sawdust that's soaked with urine, you know, urea. And, you know, some parts of the world, they pee in their gardens. And I was just wondering, is that good to put around any kind of plants or, or it just seems like, you know, I, I've always wondered about that. Um, well, here's what I would say that on the whole animal feces, like the kitty poops. No, just the pee, just the pee. Because okay. yeah. those can actually carry some really funky right. things that you don't want to get. And if they've been in the litter, it's it's possible that some of the litter near, or even if you take out the poops, there still could be some c contamination. Right. So if you have access to a very hot compost pile, you oh. could try hot composting the pellets after that. Um, and yet the thing about the urine, okay. So there's a long history of, of using human urine in various ways. For instance, it's a great fixative for dyes and it was the classic fixative for blue dyes. And so all the dyers houses used to stink because they would have pots of pea sitting around and it has to be aged before it can be used. You don't use it fresh. Um, there's a tradition as well of using male predator urine to chase away deer and mm -hmm. rabbits and things like that. Um, but they have to be young predators. So you, like if you have teenage boys around, they can whiz around the garden and that's helpful. Your old guy, maybe not so much. <laughs> um, I hate to break it to him, but you know, it has to be active. Um, uh, if you buy, you can buy coyote urine and stuff like that, but you should know that they're kept in cages like really small cages with trenches in them and their pee is pulled off and sold to hunters and, uh, wow. and gardeners. And I think that's just cruel and horrible and I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Sorry about kind of the gross. Uh, oh, it's you know, pee happens, right? But using it in your garden, many of the English famous English gardeners used to make their gardeners pee in a barrel in the greenhouse and then they would age it and then use it. And you're right, it's a good source. Urea is an, uh, a good nitrogen source. Um, but again, and, and generally human urine is actually sterile unless you have an infection. Um, so it isn't likely, it just, you know, as it degrades, it really doesn't smell very good. Um, but I would say with those precautions, you could probably go ahead. Thank you. We don't have any male predators here today, but um, some days we do. And, you know, it's always, it's like teenagers are great. Right. I years ago planted snow on the mountain. I don't know what the technical thing is. It's rastium. Oh, yeah. And am I, I can't, what do I do now? I just let it take over. What do I do? Because it's getting in, yeah, it's everywhere. And I fought it for several years. And I'm just trying to figure out if there's a smarter way to deal with it. 
Well, now, are you sure it's snow on the mountain and not Bishop's weed? Well, it's <laughs> variegated. Um, I thought it was snow on the mountain. Um, and it <laughs> has the underground, you know, it goes down yeah. deep and... Here's the thing. So threads. snow on the mountain is pretty invasive, but it has small sort of almost velvety leaves and they're usually grayish and the variegated one is sort of gray and silver and they're low growing and they have big filmy spumes of white flowers that just look like little, uh -huh. not daisies really, but like little um, foam flowers. And if it's that, that, that's not as hard to get rid of. But if it's actually bishop weed, which could be variegated and would have a different kind of like an, um, what we would call an humble blossom. Let's see if I can find a picture for you. If it's that, that's a problem because those are really hard to get out. Um, the, the thing, there's no pesticide that will work. Yeah, here. I'm sorry, you guys. I don't- It's okay, it's all right. Just, okay. Does that help? Yeah, that's Bishop Sweet. Look yeah. at you. Yeah. How, did you just draw that? No. <laughs> yeah, I just whipped it off. Oh, are you kidding? I at, <laughs> Google is your friend. So yeah, if, if that's look. what you have, which I suspect it is, it's yeah, a bit. that might be it. Yeah. Um, so, and snow on the mountain looks really pretty different. And let's see if I can find you one of those really quick. Well, I can look it up too. So, but, but if but it is Bishop Sweet, then I'm, I'm cooked. Well, if it's Bishop's weed, it's, uh, there's three things actually it could be. So yep, Bishop's, it's Bishop's weed. You sure? That's what it is. Okay. Well, that's, there's, there's also, yes. um, Archangel is another one that a lot of people have issues with. And that's it. No, but I, when I bought here's it. Here's what I, that looks like. And Archangel has yellow flowers, yellow or kind of canary. Oh or, yeah, that might be, it's a little more yellow than yeah, it is. Well, what, That's but, also a disaster. Um, yeah, well, yeah, right? I can attest to that. It doesn't yeah. go away. I can't get it out. It's very difficult. But what you mm -hmm. do is you starve it out first. You cut it and cut it and cut it and let it get some growth on it. Especially at this time of year, it's using the storage root to replenish. Mm -hmm. the right. So let it do that and then cut it. When it gets like four inches high and got some okay. leaves on it, cut it. Next time it's four inches high with some leaves on it, cut it and just keep, do you have a weed whacker or anything like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, just whack the shit out of it. And if I don't, there. I'll get one. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, if, if you have a big area, it's worth it. Otherwise, if you yeah. can cut it by hand, then great. You know, if it's not that big a patch, but if it's a big area, you wanna just cut, 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 cut. And then when it's sort of depressed and it's not coming back, you smother mulch really deeply with like, um, Wood chips, not bark, yeah. but wood chips, like wood chips. this much. Okay. I'm talking a foot. Okay. Okay. And you'll still get some. And then over a couple of years, you, that will smother out most of it. And then you can rake that off and dig out because then the ground underneath it will be opened up. Because right. one of the things that happens is it thrives in our clay or heavy acid clay soil that's <laughs> hard as a rock, right? Right. And so right. when we open the soil and loosen it and get some worm action going and stuff like that, it means that in down the road, but this smother mulch of, I mean, seriously, like a, a good foot of coarse wood chips. Um, and if it's in a public area, you could use medium wood chips, but if it's in a place that not too many people are going, use the coarse ones that are like hog fuel even, it doesn't matter, they're super cheap, but it will, as they degrade, they, they're gonna open the soil up for you and then, one of the things that will happen too is while they're breaking down, they're using some of the nitrogen in the soil, which starts out the plants even a little bit more. Then you can usually dig out the rest of them or the more sustainable technique is cause them to be dug out by someone younger than yourself. <laughs> Just Thank saying. you for that. Thank yeah. you. The tricky thing is, is that it's in, you know, like I've got these beautiful maidenhair ferns you know, it's in this area with some kind of precious plants. And, you know, it's like the wood chips are going to be kind of tricky. I'm going to have to. You might have to move those beautiful plants right. for a couple of years. So if you can find an area where you could create a nursery bed where they could be for a couple of years. Okay. Or put them in really large pots. Um, right. To get rid of that stuff really takes some effort. 
And okay. you know, it's still sold in both of these really nice suites are still well, sold. And I was thinking, is there a way to just live with it and contain it? You know, I'm just trying well, you know, yeah, I can't you can't it, join it, you know. You can't have other things. You can't have little maiden hair ferns with it, no right. way. And these are beautiful, big, old maiden hair ferns. So mm -hmm. it's just heartbreaking. But thank you. Those are yeah. my well, and That's, there, you know, in that area, I would suggest that you just cut, 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 and mulch more reasonably, like uh, lightly around the maiden hair, yeah. and they're much deeper in other areas, and and then they should be okay. They do not take drying out very well at all. So one of the things you want to be sure about with a maiden hair is that you maintain yeah. moisture, but you also don't want to be don't be surface watering the whole area because then you're going to be encouraging the. <laughs> Oh, which is it. why these grow together yeah. so well so is spot because... water just mm -hmm. make sure you're spot watering only on those precious ones and mm -hmm. clear them just keep on it like every time you see them just and and you can work you don't want to be digging around the roots of that maiden hair fern and you know right like, like a tree they spread pretty wide so be careful about when you're removing the roots of the weed you probably want to do that like in the winter more around the plants mm -hmm. themselves. You can do it anytime in a big infested area. But when you're working with delicate plants, confine yourself to the dormancy period because right. they don't notice as much. Right, right. All good. All makes all kinds of sense. So thank you. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's hard when, you know, nurseries sell pretty plants and you don't, they don't come with a warning, by the way, unless you have 80 acres, you do really don't want this thing. Um, but if no. you drive around the island, I don't know if you've seen, like, there used to be that place to, uh, when you were leaving town on, like, Winslow Way going to the south. That the, um, there were just this huge overgrown property that was full of uh, Vinca Major, which, like, Vinca oh, is the blue flower yeah. plant. And this is the nice. variegated form with the yellow and white, and it's really pretty. But there was, like, a good half acre of it. <laughs> several places on the island where that kind of thing has happened over the years. And wow. it's like some plants, you couldn't really call them invasive exactly, but there's certainly territorial takeovers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is my nemesis is what it is. I just... <laughs> You're not alone. Um, yeah. And the one thing to know is that it's not, do not try to use, well, I know you wouldn't, but don't try to use herbicides on them because it doesn't work for those plants. They have such big storage roots and you will contaminate a, a, your other plants everything else and, well and something like a fern is very sensitive to any kind of herbicide it's even ferns are very sensitive to uh, fertilizers and can be killed by anything over like mm. a 555 wow um, yeah okay there was a, an incident of with someone who asked me to come and look at some stuff and she had been she thought her woodland garden looked a little hungry so she fed it with 10 10 10 and a lot of things died and the reason mm. it looked hungry is because it was over manicured because it was oh. I've scraped every bit of soil, you know, was being scraped away. So the roots are exposed. Over tidiness is as bad mm -hmm. as pesticide or herbicide in some ways. Okay. It's a call for natural slobbery. Love mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I've heard you say that before and I, and I repeat it to myself. <laughs> this is a good garden. It's very, you know, well, lots of stuff in there. If you forget what a garden is supposed to look like, walk in the woods. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody is out there raking and nobody's picking up all the leaves and all the bits that fall off the trees. And it turns yes. into beautiful forest stuff, you know, in an un, uh, un, untrammeled forest, you'll find stuff that's like a foot deep, right? Even yeah. with all these tons of roots through it. So it's like leaving things alone is a huge principle and tidiness is really, you know, consider it part of white colonial supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> Because it is actually the hand of man, you know, it is. It's sort of a form of plant racism. Um, I'm not even stretching a point here. <laughs> it's something to really think about. Like, if we want to have a balanced relationship with our planet, we have to start thinking about reciprocity. Like, we take, 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 and expect give, 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 but we don't give back. And, you know, throwing some fertilizer and some water down, giving a little compost, that's, those are good things. But if we had a better sense of balance, we wouldn't need to do as much of that, right? Now, it's true that in the last decade or so, we've had such serious droughts and heat waves that we've seen native plants suffering. So I'm not saying you should never do anything and 
gardens are completely natural because they're not. But I am saying that the whole sense of control and tidiness is one of the things that kind of, it's like blinkers that keep us from seeing natural beauty sometimes or recognizing how to live with, like you were saying before. Um, and living with noxious weeds is different from living with <laughs> a nicely balanced garden right. with a lot of uh, participants, right? A community right. of plants. Exactly. It's like it's a bully plant because it's, yeah. it's taking over, you know, other and actual native. I mean, their maiden air, you know, is right. these natural, wonderful, delicate things. But well, look at ivy. You know, oh, yeah. Right. And mm. that was sold widely in Washington. Now it's not legal to sell ivy in Washington or Oregon, but it was legal for quite a while. I mean, a lot of us campaigned pretty hard because uh, that, as we see here, it's really obvious what happens if you let ivy take over, it, it will mm -hmm. take down trees, right? Yeah. And that doesn't happen in England. And so it's funny because some of the English gardeners get really upset when we, they, you know, we talk smack about ivy and they're like, but it's beautiful and trees don't mind. And it's like in Europe where both are native and grouped together for thousands of years, they've accommodated each other. But here in the Pacific Northwest, the trees do not have the kind of root structure that can support, you know, six tons of dead weight when a rain comes and there's huge masses of ivy all over a tree. And in fact, I was in a um, I was in a botanical garden in France a number of years ago with a group, and they were talking about that exact issue and saying the ivy. You Americans are so crazy about you know rabid about getting rid of ivy, and then we came to the there it was a, a botanical garden with sections of different plant zones around the world, and we came to the section on of the Pacific Northwest, and there were so many trees down. They'd had a big blow that winter, and I was sort of like. This is what happens because you let ivy climb on northwestern trees and they can't handle it. And we got into a very passionate argument, not to say cat fight about it, but I was kind of <laughs> like, look around. Uh, so just, you know, remembering that there are plants that we don't really want to unleash. Oh. Um, have I intimidated you all thoroughly now? <laughs> no, no, no. Can you hear me, Ann? This is Rita. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm on the phone in my car, so I, <laughs> I was going to say for tidiness, it's, it's a hard thing sometimes, not for me, but for my son-in-law and daughter whom I live with. So it's hard to, you know, where he's, they're getting better. And, um, and the wood and the wood chips I put on a berm behind our little pond, you know, several years ago, and they're like, a foot deep and they've taken we've gotten it so the bad blackberries and stuff are pretty much under control so it's good and that dirt because it's just all clay is getting better if we dig a little bit into it so I really want to encourage you all to mulch deeply and a foot is awesome <laughs> that's right and you know the tidy lawn thing is a big deal for a lot of people <sighs> Audubon Society has put out, the Audubon Society has a fabulous lawn program for homeowners and for golf courses. And I've been trying to get the golf courses here on the island to use it over the years. They, some people get into it and then they let it go and a new greenkeeper comes in and blah, blah, blah. It's a constant fight. But the schools, the schools here on Bainbridge have adopted it and they don't use like the pesticide chemicals anymore on the lawns and they don't, uh, or they hadn't, I don't know, I haven't checked in the last five years or so, but they've been pretty good for quite a long time because it's been so proven that those chemicals are awful for kids and dogs and anybody. And, you know, it's there's a pretty long period where those things are active. It's not just let, set it down and wait a day. It's much longer than that, especially if they get wet. But if you have anybody in your life who is a lawn addict, you might introduce them to the Audubon uh, lawn program because it's actually a wonderful way to treat the soil. And that's really the issue. It's like soil is our most, one of our most precious assets on this planet, right? And one thing we can all do as gardeners, even if you have a very small space, is treat whatever soil you have 
with kindness and respect. And one of the cool things about compost, and I know I talk about compost all the time, but one of the great things about it is that as little as a quarter inch of compost spread over bare soil can begin sequestering and storing, drawing down carbon within a matter of days. It's really interesting because these are recent studies because people were like, well, how much do I have to actually do? And so a number of the land grant universities across the country have been looking into it. Um, compost companies are typically small. They don't have the money for big studies and stuff, but the land grant universities work a lot with agriculturalists and farmers and, um, and the extension agents. And so that's been something, some research that's been done a lot in the last, I don't know, five, six years, especially. Um, so the, the fact that even in your pots and containers, you could be helping draw down carbon, right? And plants are like straws. They pull carbon out of the air and plant it into, you know, put it in the soil. The trees can be putting that carbon as much as 20 feet down. So anything we can do to help that process is really important. And anyone who has wooded acreage, that's a really huge piece because by cleaning it up and parking it out, you actually destroy the, the natural balance of plants and you actually harm the soil and you actually harm your trees and shrubs. Like that gal whose place was looking kind of spindly because she'd been raking it so vigorously that she'd removed all the natural goodness from the soil. In fact, put down compost and then later raked it up. I think we've probably all seen places around town where they hire crews to do that, right? It's yeah. craziness. So whatever amount of soil you have, if you can nurture it to the best of your ability, if you have any ability to work with public places around you, like the senior center, where by the way, we're having a hands-on uh, garden session on um, Saturday, this upcoming Saturday from 10 to 12.30 with pizza and coffee. Uh, <laughs> anybody who's got a pair of hands and willing, uh, Rita's gonna be helping supervise planting um, the front bed adding a bunch of annual color to that and then in the back we're going to be taking out a lot of the overgrown trees and shrubs that were put in in 1985. Uh, it's sort of hilarious there's a total deep shade area and the plaque says Mediterranean plants for sun and you're like yeah well, then it was now it's not. Um, but anytime you have a chance at a school at a church at a business to help guide uh, good soil care please do step up and speak up because it really matters what we do. And I have a question. Um, next to our new place here, there in the common area, there's cherry trees. <laughs> and this one cherry tree is just glorious. It um, has a lot, it's kind of umbrella-like. It's just not so straight up. And it had amazing blo uh, bloom on it. And I know there's a difference between cherry blossom trees and cherry trees. <laughs> But this particular tree, um, all of the pink petals are gone, but now it's growing these little white blossoms. Are that, is that the fruit blossoms or? Well, are you sure they're blossoms? Take a picture and send it to me because usually typically what happens is if those, if those early blossoms were in fact pollinated, then the little fruit would be getting to form. You'd get oh, a little okay. fruit, okay. fruit and it could look white or pale, pale, pale green at first. However, this year there was very little pollinator activity because it's been so cold. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering whether we're gonna have a pretty lean, poor fruit year. This It's conceivable that, especially the early bloomers, the earliest cherries and so forth. On ornamental cherries, it's not much of an issue because usually they're not, uh, even the birds don't love them particularly. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it may well be that we don't get anything like the kind of fruit set we are used to because they're, I've only seen two or three bees this year. Mm, and mm. I'm in gardens a lot. Um, and again, this cold, wet, windy weather is not their preferred. They, no. they can't navigate in that. So that might be part of the issue. But yeah, take a look at it. Take a picture of it. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, because it was just covered with, you know, brilliant pink. And now the pink's gone. The leaves are coming out. But now there's like little white blossoms, which it I think, what's going on? It might be the calyx that was the frame for the, like, when, when petals are held onto a, a blossom, there's a usually a small leafy frame for them that look like little leaves almost in a, in a circle, right? And oh. then it attaches to the stem. And often those are light colored too, and it could be that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, I'm just, you know, interested because yeah. I'm getting used to this new yard and everything, so. Right. Okay, yeah. 
So it'll be interesting to see if there's any kind of fruit. <laughs> Janet, did you have any, was there anything you were interested in particularly? Oh, I don't know if she can hear us. Oh. Oh, Janet. You're mute. No, nothing. Okay. okay. I love, I'm just loving listening. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to make sure. How about you, Linda? Did you have more, um, anything else you would like to know about? You're muted again. Well, you know, there's just untold numbers of questions, you know, that I have. I, I live in a small ADU on my daughter's property. And so she just planted a whole bunch of bare root roses. She planted five rainier cherry trees. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it's all kind of like virgin yard. It's a half acre of kind of, it was covered with blackberries. So now there's grass, there's roses, they've got the gardens going, but you know, we've been here less than 10 years from the Southwest. So this is all completely, you know, and I heard a bumble just last night, open the door and there's all these possums on my deck, you know, and there's raccoons and, um, you know, you're just like, wow. So it'll just be interesting to see what happens, you know, and, um, you know, we may get a few tomatoes, hopefully, you know, the deer won't eat the roses and, um, you know, it's just so exciting to live in such a beautiful place. It is, and it's very different from the Southwest. Oh, so yeah. one of the things, you know, I'm sure you're figuring that out in 10 years, um, but it's also different from the Northwest. In other words, we're not getting what we used to think of as typical weather anymore. And, you know, different kinds of highs and different kinds of lows. We have many, many more. In the past 20 years, we've had more 100 year events than in the last 100 years, if that makes sense. Um, so we, you know, we keep having, uh, you know, whatever the previous mark was, we keep exceeding it in terms of heat and cold and wind and so forth um, and rainfall and all sorts of things, right? So we don't really know what to expect either. And one of the things that's going to certainly be changing is that our usual palette is going to have to change probably. And we don't yet know. I've been asking different governments, um, agencies like well what are you suggesting and they're all saying well we don't know yet it's like great like for a while we were all saying well look south because we're kind of assuming that as things get warmer we will be able to grow stuff from say northern oregon or you know southern washington state um maybe even northern california but that isn't strictly true since so many conditions are different like you know from the amount of rainfall the amount of sun the kind of wind the kind of soil there are a lot of differences but I do think it's worth thinking about looking at plants like manzanitas, for instance, which are uh, very common in, in our drier areas, but because we are getting such different um, averages, it's worth thinking about plants like that. And I'm saying instead of planting ornamental cherries and plums, I'm telling people to try uh, crepe myrtles, which mm -hmm. are native to our south, uh, south and southwest and actually into the southeast as well and there's some really rugged hybrids that have been bred with also other crepe mineral species from other parts of the world that are tough we've put some we put in four of them at the senior center and they actually came through the 17 degrees and the hard winds pretty well i'm quite impressed mm -hmm. um, but thinking about not necessarily trying to do the same old same old but being a little more flexible about what we plant and not feeling guilty if things die right you do not control the weather i wish we did but we don't and and realizing that you know <laughs> we can give everything our best care i still feel like the best thing we can do is be as uh, reciprocal as possible like when we clear up an area like you're describing and taking away all the blackberries and stuff that's awesome and then putting in new plants i hope that you'll really make sure that every year you're putting compost on the lawn and compost in all those beds. And I talk about compost a lot because it's the one ingredient that makes the biggest difference to our heavy soils. Um, mm -hmm. They're very nutritive and they certainly retain water, but they're not very high in humus. And that is partly because back in the day and not that long ago for many of these places, 
this was a climax forest. And you can take away the trees, but you haven't been able to change the biological uh, levels and balance of the soil itself. And the soil that works with trees and shrubs for millennia is going to be fungally based. And people freak out when they see like, you know, circles of mushrooms in their lawns and stuff. But actually those fungal companions are really helpful and they are building better soil and they help degrade um, uh, some of the rotting wood products and things like that. So they're not anything to fight or get rid of at all. And it's important to remember that like when we're taking out forest and, and you know having land that maybe was logged 10, 20, even 30, maybe even 50 years ago, the soil is still going to be uh, balanced toward the fungal rather than the bacterial. And the bacterial soils are the ones that work best with lawns and annuals and a lot of our vegetables. And so that's why compost again is your best friend because it's introducing those bacterial components it's creating the soil pH balance, much less acid, much more neutral. That's going to be better for, lawn, uh, for lawns and vegetables and flowers of all kinds. I hope that makes sense. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So again, the, you know, having a, there's some great free advice on websites from the county, um, Kitsap County and King County both. Uh, they're called like natural care garden techniques and things like that. You can find them at a lot of places. And, and what they'll do is talk to you about how to take care of the soil so that you're not creating runoff into the water. We're not polluting the water because all those pesticides and herbicides go downstream. And we all live downstream of somebody, right? And we have to protect the soil, the air, and the water to make sure that we're creating a healthy future for our grandkids and the future generations, right? Not to mention our own selves. Um, but that's why we carp so strong about herbicides and pesticides and about in using natural materials like compost instead, because we're taking so much from the land and expecting so much production and just throwing on a handful of chemical fertilizer is not the same as feeding the soil with compost, which actually builds the soil life. And the soil life is what, like if you feed your soil, the soil will feed your plants. And you know, you know the annuals in pots and things like that, they're gonna need help. That's where you want to put, you know, the 2020 stuff every few weeks because it gets washed out every time you water. Um, but on the soil itself, we should be building the soil to support the plants rather than relying on chemical inputs. I, I feel like it's one of our civic duties. <laughs> mm -hmm. with, the, with the cold winter, I have some flax, you know, those big spiky uh -huh. plants, and they, they've look really beat up. Do I cut them back now? Yeah, or? well, you can still wait a little bit longer, but I, you do have to cut them back and see if the base is just mush. Yeah. Like I had some cabbage palms and they just went to absolute mush. They don't tolerate this temperature. Uh, um, we had some here in the park and in the library um, and they're just gone. They're gone. Um, but the New Zealand flax can be fairly resilient depending on how long they've been in the ground and how good their root system is. So if you take, just carefully cut back all the damaged foliage, if a leaf is half good and half damaged, just cut off the damage because the oh. half good is still going to be okay. photosynthetic and be pulling in nutrients for that plant, right? And then right. over time, if it refurbishes, okay, don't feed a damaged plant, just compost and water because okay. they can't handle the, uh, it's like feeding a cancer patient a steak dinner. Mm. <laughs> you can't do it. Can't do it. They yeah. can't support it, right? You could put some, you know, some coffee grounds down in May or June if it seems to be doing okay, but don't feed it because that just makes things worse, actually. Mm. But yeah, we've seen a lot of damage, and sometimes after the big freezes like that, initially things look okay, and you're like, oh look, this is okay. It's gonna make, and then you go, oh look, all the tips are turning brown. Oh look, half of the leaves fell off. Oh look. <laughs> Ciao, goodbye. You know, it takes a while for the, um, for especially woody plants, it takes a while for them to really, you know, die all the way down. So we can't always tell what damage is done. And that's why I say don't prune stuff off till it's really clearly dead. Um, you can put your hand on a plant and feel the difference in, if it's a live plant, it will be cooler than the ambient temperature into your hand. It will feel a little bit cool and alive. 
And if it's a dead planet, it will feel exactly room temperature. I mean, whatever the air temperature is. That is weird. I didn't. Know well, not that. really, because if you think about it, it's it's just it's a circulatory system, and yeah. like any you know, anytime there's circulation moving, huh. there's an evaporative effect, and it cools things off. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Thanks. And so, if you're going to start pruning on something that looks like it might be dead, you can start with finger pruning. Just go up and down like this with gloves on. And all the dead stuff will just fall off, like camellias and things too. You can just shake them out. And right. All that stuff will fall off. Anything that's just twiggy and dead on a maple, like Japanese maple, just finger prune them first, and then take a look at what there's what's going on. And if you can see there's dead branches, sometimes there's a whole vascular issue, and one whole side will go or something, and you then you'll see that revealed much better. Thanks. Yeah, hand pruning, good te good technique. We have a few more minutes if anybody has some more to, uh, no? to ask about. I did want to say on Friday, too, we're going to do a program here in the same, same time slot about um, Earth Day is for Everyone. And I'm going to be joined by Barbara O oh and by um, Diane Landry of Zero Waste. And they're going to talk a lot about practical, everyday things we can all do to have a more reciprocal relationship with our planet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, wildfire protection. And again, some of these same things, but also some of, I want to talk about some sort of uh, family-friendly plant projects that might be fun to do with grandkids um, or neighborhood kids, like sunflower tents and, you know, bean teepees and things like that are great. Um, helping kids grow plants from seed. My granddaughter and I have, are sprouting, I think we have about 150 sunflowers now. Some of them are going to go at the sun at the senior center, and some will go at the library, and some other places. If you see a little sunflower forest around town, you'll know that that was a homegrown effort. But that's the kind of plant that's so fun for kids because they're very reliable. The seeds are big enough to see and handle, and you get a great result, right? Um, and then in my pea patch at the Eagle Harbor Church, I planted a lot of them last year and left them in place until they were stripped clean, and they were covered in the earlier part of the summer, they were always covered with bees and butterflies who were mm. after the nectar and the pollen. And then when the seeds ripened, the birds were after them and they stripped them clean and got every seed out of there. And so it's like, there's a give back plant for you, right? I'd love to think about things like that, like letting some of your lettuce and greens go to seed and flower, I mean, first, and then the flower will bring in the bees, you let them go to seed and the birds will pick up on the seeds. And they'll self-sow to a certain amount and you'll get like parsley and things like that will always come back free, <laughs> free plants, right? If you let them, like, let them go. Um, it's like a little bit of uh, benign neglect, right? Not, not being so tidy again. In fact, tomatoes, Rita last year brought some tomato starts that had come where some little cherries had fallen in the ground and not been picked up or something, right? And got mixed in with the mulch and they sprouted and we got four little plants, which I put in at the senior center and they bloomed and flowered and produced all summer. We put them out on the front and people were, passers-by were picking those little beautiful cherry tomatoes. That's the other thing I would say to all of you who want to grow tomatoes, you're going to have the most success with the cherry tomatoes, the grape, you know, the grape clusters, the smaller fruited ones, and also with regional selections. Like there's one called Seattle's Best. Well, guess what? It was selected in the 50s which was also a cold cycle in Seattle. And it's one that does very well in cool springs and cool winters. Uh, I mean, cool summers when we don't get the kind of accumulated heat that, that a lot of the other kinds, like some of the ones that are bred for Iowa, forget it, they're never happy here. But plants that say things like Oregon Sunrise or Seattle's favorite, those are gonna be good ones to try here. And also some of the Russian ones like um, Stupis is, a pretty mm -hmm. common, you can find that usually in that spread in Novosibirsk. And it, <laughs> if it can do well there, it can do well here. Um, and we've had pretty good luck with that cosmonaut, uh, what was his name? Cosmonaut Yuri Valenko or something like that. Then anyway, the cosmonaut ones, they're going to do good too. And I think uh, we just have to be very flexible about our expectations. Does not to say some people do really well with big tomatoes, but they require a great deal of work on a very frequent basis. They need the protection, they need the feeding, they need the watering and the pruning because those there's also indeterminate tomato plants. And be sure you check the label because if you don't have a big space and you're growing in a pot, 
you want a determinate plant that <laughs> knows when to stop, right? And indeterminate plants just never quit and they can get enormous and like seriously six, eight feet. And, and that's crazy for most of us. And we wanna make sure we're growing something that's appropriate in size and scope to the area we have to give it. Um, I grew a wild, a wild a cherry tomato from Oaxaca last year at the senior center. And it was one of those ones that the berries were tiny and really delicious, but the plant itself was at least, it didn't get very high, but it got, it fell over the side of the bin and it was at least five or six feet wide. And, and long, you know, it would have been tall, but it was growing like a bush, right? Crazy. Um, so you wanna know what's the size of fruit? How much am I likely to get out of it? Should I be pruning it or not? All those things will be easier to figure out if you read the label and be very clear what kind of plant you're buying, whether it's determinate or indeterminate, cherry or giant whopper slicer. Slicers don't usually do so well here, but like the Seattle's ones are usually about so like, softball, maybe a little smaller than a softball, but um, of a decent size if you want a salad tomato and they're really flavorful and good and very reliable in this region. One of the other things, Anne, this was Rita, that I, that I say, my, my, my daughter wanted to put in some raspberries and we just don't have a big enough space with long, with long enough sun. So she put them in and I said, you know, we don't really have to grow those because the whole month of July, we can go to the, we can go to the farm stand or go to the farmer's market. It's the same thing with these big, awesome tomatoes. You can go and you can support the local farmers and, and they grow them and they've got the ability to do it. And, you know, and we don't have to do all that time and energy, but we still get to enjoy them. Same thing with strawberries, a whole month of what, June up at Day Road. And I mean, in other places, you can just buy them and there they are. So we're supporting our local economy. Plus we're saving ourselves from, you know, frustration sometimes. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And all those tomatoes, they're greenhouse grown. And if you don't have a greenhouse yourself, and even if right. you do, it's a lot of work to, to, you know, maintain plants in a greenhouse. Even my little like unheated sun porch, I have to water every day when it's been at all warm because plants, right. you know, you're surprised how much transpiration is going on out there. But you have an excellent point, and you're right. Right? If you know, if you don't have much space, you're probably best off growing some things that you're going to use a lot. Like for me, it's fresh herbs and greens. So mm -hmm. I like kale. I planted a dozen different kinds of kale this year, um, and I usually do. But you know, a few plants each of of that many kinds is plenty for me. And and lettuces, year-round lettuces, and maybe arugula, radicchio, things like that. And the fresh herbs because I use them a lot. But really, other stuff. I always grow some beans because there's some kinds I love and beans are so fun to sprout. But there's nothing more hopeful or joyful than watching a bean plant sprout and put out its first leaves. It unfurls these angel wing leaves and nothing looks happier on the planet. It's so great, like guaranteed to lift your spirits. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll always grow a few beans just for love. Yeah. Gives us hope. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I saw, I, maybe I've told you all this story before, but um, there was an area we used to go past a lot where there was a little old house with a little sweet garden and it got torn down and paved over and it was turned into a car, car lot. But year after year, these daffodils would come up through the asphalt and oh. they punctured the asphalt. Like the will of a plant to live is very strong. And you love, I mean, how cool is that? But well, A, it meant they probably hadn't put a very good base for their car lot but also that this very strong growing daffodil came right through and punctured the uh the asphalt every year wow um, right? actually and before you head out i do have one really quick that reminds me you just saying that about daffodils i bought all these daffodil bulbs years ago i planted them at, by the road oh sorry just ignore that but i um they don't, only two out of this huge row bloomed. So I pulled some of those out um, and, and tried planting them in a different location and they still were not blooming. So can you have bad bulbs that just don't bloom? Well, or, with that, with daffodils, it's more likely that they're starving. Like if um, okay. they need to be fed because, and they need to be fed 
in the green. So the time to feed them is now, like as the flowers fade, you always want to snip off the top of the flower because it starts to make a green bulb and it's going to try to make seed. That takes right. a lot of energy for that plant. And it's already put out a lot of energy to bloom. So you want to pop those heads off so they don't try to make seeds and then give them some balanced fertilizer, that Dr. Earth stuff. Um, because if you want a plant to produce over and over and over, they have to either be in excellent soil, which is not very common around here, no. or they need to be fertilized. And a lot of the roadside plants, you know, might get cut before they're, like one of the ways to destroy a bulb is to cut its foliage off before it's ripened. Right. So you have to let them turn brown all the way down. Right, right. Um, and so if they get yeah. mowed along the ride, this, you know, the street by the city or something, they're not going to be able to build up their reserves again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't, things. yeah, I'll try the fertilizer now, but like I might have 30 or 40 of these and only two bloomed. So I don't have even the you know, the blooms to pinch off. Well, you don't have to so, pinch off the blooms if they didn't bloom, but you can see where the leaves are. So yes. clear whatever else is around them, clear around the bulbs and scatter this, you know, Dr. Earth stuff and then put some compost down over it and try to keep them clear through the year. And you should mm. get like, you yeah, know, right. Right. Maybe that's it. Part and of and it, then in the I fall, thought. again, if you remember where they are, like I often will pile stones in an area like that yeah. to remind myself of what it, um, and then you can cover that with mulch, but then in the fall, do it again. Like that's another big time to feed them. Cause right. even though you don't, that's when you would be planting them, you don't see them, but that's when they're working on their roots and starting okay. to build the root system that's gonna support the, the blossoms later. And if they don't get fed, they don't produce. All right, good. Yeah. Give it a try, thank you. You're welcome. Wow, great information today, Ann. I was just gonna say some of the original bulbs that Mary Sam, planted around her cabin in the woods between Phelps and um, Madison were recaptured. Mary Sam was a, a native Suquamish midwife who helped a lot of people on the island and she liked to trade for plants. And her cabin had fallen down long ago, but when I used to live on Madison, her cabin was kind of behind our house in the woods. And the, you could still see the rectangle of where her cabin had been because the daffodils were coming up every year. Because the forest stuff had been left to accumulate. So those mm -hmm. plants were getting left alone benign neglect and they were still blooming and so Mary Terry and I dug up a bunch of them and we put them at the historic museum but when the historic museum moved from strawberry to uh down the by Hall, yeah. um, we dug those bulbs up again and put them some at the um, waypoint and some at the library oh. so but those bulbs are like seriously a couple hundred years old that's fabulous. and they are still blooming oh. right so it's not that the bulbs are weak, it's that they haven't been given what they need. Yeah. Anyway, thanks everybody.